Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, to the participants. Um, I know we have people from all over the world, and I do not know what time zone you're in. Um, so I send my greetings to you, and thank you for attending this uh, presentation on the use of phenyl neurolysis for the treatment of upper limb post-stroke spasticity. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Professor Sheng Li, who is in my faculty, uh, who has done a lot of work uh, in the area of um, uh, phenol injections. Uh, in particular, are trying to revive the use of phenol in the upper limb. For the longest time, the use of phenol for spasticity in adults in the United States has been relegated pretty much just to the lower limb because of earlier publications suggesting that upper limb injections with phenol can cause a lot of um, adverse effects. There are still many questions, uh, and, and partly it's because not too many clinicians are using phenol, um, either because of lack of training or lack of resources or access to the drug. Here are some of the common questions that we have received from our colleagues, which we will try to address in our short presentation. Phenol is a chemical, uh, and in fact, the United States Food and Drug Administration does not classify it as a drug. Instead, it is a chemical, uh, which it is. It's an aromatic organic compound that is widely used in manufacturing plastics and similar materials. However, this has also been used for medical purposes. About 200 years ago, phenol was first used as an antiseptic um, for um, uh, operative procedures. Later on, uh, phenol uh, in weak preparations, such as 1.4%, is used as an oral spray to help relieve sore throat. And then in the 1950s, along with alcohol, phenol was used for nerve blocks specifically to treat cancer-related pain. It was much later when phenol was um, first used in children with cerebral palsy and spasticity and dystonia uh, for treatment. And uh, since then, it has been applied in any central nervous system condition that has severe spasticity of one or more limbs. Phenol works by denaturing protein and coagulating protein, by demyelination, and by uh, eventually a degeneration of the axon. It is a non-selective destruction of nerve fibers of all sizes. Phenol, depending on the dose and concentration used, penetrates the perineurium and it can damage the endoneurum and the axons within. However, the immediate effect is secondary only to the acute demyelinating process, but the true spasmolytic effect is delayed. And that is secondary to the destruction of nerve fibers, which may take a few hours to take full effect. Unlike botulinum toxin injections, of which I am sure many of you are familiar with, phenol is injected either in the nerve or in the um, motor branches uh, of the nerve as they enter the muscle. Clinically, the effect of phenol is dose dependent. Uh, the most commonly used uh, preparations are five to 7%. Concentrations of 3% or less usually have anesthetic properties only. At our center, we have been using aqueous phenol, 6%. Phenol is water soluble. Uh, and it can be uh, dissolved either in water or in um, uh, glycerine. We choose uh, uh, the uh, aqueous preparation for ease of injection um, and uh, because of the experience that we have had uh, in the successful use of this treatment modality for people with spasticity. <clears throat> the lethal dose of phenol in adults is 8.5 milligrams. So the clinical doses that are being used are way below this. So just above this, you can see a computation of the uh, amount of phenol. Um, so with 6% um, of phenol, uh, with one ml, there is 60 milligrams of um, phenol. And if we use a total of 20 milliliters, which is not that common, um, you um, may be uh, introducing 1,200 milligrams only, which is, or I'm sorry, 1.2 grams, which is way below the lethal dose of 8.5 grams. Clinically, when there is a systemic reaction, uh, patients complain of unusual taste, usually a metallic or fishy taste. 
Uh, when that happens, we uh, abort the procedure um, and let the patient recover uh, before uh, uh, resuming the uh, procedure. Uh, in severe cases where there can be inadvertent introduction of phenol into the vascular system, cardiovascular failure and severe central nervous system dysfunction in the form of seizures may occur. Now, regarding the onset peak effect and time to peak of phenol, uh, here is a series of photos uh, courtesy of Dr. Sheng Li uh, demonstrating the effects. Uh, this is a, a, a gentleman with um, um, uh, elbow flexor uh, spasticity uh, that has failed to respond to non-pharmacologic interventions. Immediately after uh, the injection, you can see the change in the angle and two weeks post injection, there was further increase in the range. Of course, it was not just phenol, but also phenol and a lot of stretching and other uh, physical uh, and occupational therapy modalities. Uh, the red lines um, try to illustrate the change in the angle of the elbow following introduction of phenol. In a uh, study published by Dr. Lee uh, and some and a couple of our trainees, um, I'm showing you here the um, uh, changes in the resting angle of the elbow uh, from the time of injection, right after injection, and after six weeks follow-up. Uh, you can see the, the difference from the baseline, the mean baseline, to immediately after, and pay attention to uh, uh, seven days. If you calculate the change or the improvement in the um, angle uh, in terms of degrees from pre-injection to immediately post-injection to that of pre-injection to post-injection seven days later, um, about 60% of, uh, there's a 60% um, uh, difference. So uh, based on that small study, um, we found this um, the, the, to be very helpful. Um, phenol neurolysis is an immediate effect on spasticity reduction, but the immediate effect accounted for approximately 60% of the peak effect, meaning to say that in that small cohort in our study, uh, a further 40% improvement in the angle range of motion was achieved up to about seven days or one week post-injection when um, the therapists were able to stretch the limbs um, uh, more uh, because of the decrease in spasticity following phenol injection. Regarding the duration of effects, this is from uh, uh, Dr. Larry Horn's group. Um, here is a table comparing the, um, the different duration of the effect of phenol neurolysis depending on the location of the injection, either a peripheral nerve or a motor um, uh, point or end plate block. Um, so this um, duration is wide, and the reason is that the uh, wide range in the duration of phenol may be secondary to different factors, such as the concentration that's used, the total dose that is provided, localization technique, and what other therapies were provided following the um, uh, phenol injection. Regarding adverse effects, uh, the most common um, Adverse effect is pain from the needle injection and local inflammatory reaction from needling. Uh, bleeding can happen, and in severe cases, compartment syndrome may take place. This is one reason why we take advantage of our ultrasound machine so that when the needle is introduced, we will be able to avoid the neurovascular bundle, in particular, avoiding the vessels as we uh, introduce the phenol to the nerves. Later on, there can be weakness and overcorrection, loss of useful motor function and atrophy, and temporary sensory loss. The one that is most common, however, this was not the one that we found to be the most common in our study published uh, in the Journal of Rehabilitation Medicine a few years ago. Uh, this is thesia. This is worrisome because uh, to many patients, this is the one that causes a lot of distress. Uh, this is uh, usually seen with mixed sensory motor nerve injections. It is usually of the neuropathic type, and its onset may be a few days to two weeks later. It lasts for several weeks, but in some cases, again, depending on the dose it was used and the concentration, it may last as long as a year. The treatment is uh, repeating the injection to complete the block or giving medications such as anti-epileptics. 
Uh, here is a list of the upper limb nerves that we have injected at tier. Um, I think that uh, Dr. Lee's uh, efforts in reviving the use of phenol in upper limbs is, uh, has been quite successful uh, because, as I had mentioned earlier, for the most part up until recently, phenol uh, was used primarily just for the lower limbs. Uh, here again is another paper from Dr. Lee's group and a couple of our trainees in our institution uh, looking at uh, the effect of phenol in the distal upper extremity. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Uh, on the av on average, 1.8 milliliters per nerve or motor branch of the nerve was given, um, and that there were only three cases of adverse events, um, prim primarily prolonged pain, and no other adverse event was reported. I would like to show you a short video of a phenol of the median nerve. Uh, to address the uh, finger flexors. Again, this is courtesy of uh, Dr. Sh uh, Sheng Li. So the needle is advanced. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we take advantage of seeing the ultrasound, of using the ultrasound so that we can visualize the vessels and avoid them as we bring the needle close to the nerve. And the outcome of that injection is here prior to um, phenol injection. Uh, this is how the uh, fingers look like. And then after phenol injection, after a few hours, uh, you can see the um, relaxation of the finger flexors. Uh, here's another ultrasound technique of the musculocutaneous nerve. Here are the, uh, the vessels and the nerve that's being targeted is right in this area. It just shows you the importance of using ultrasound, not really for localization because electrical stimulation may do that as well, but to prevent any complications such as bleeding. Lastly, there are a lot of questions about the use of phenol uh, and how it compares to botulinum toxins. Here is a table comparing the two. Uh, and uh, once again, in the interest of time, I just want to hit the highlights. Um, the mechanism of actions are different. Onset and the uh, duration of effects are different as well. Uh, adverse events, however, are slightly higher for phenol than it is for botulinum toxins. And when it turns to cost, at least in the United States, phenol is very affordable as compared to botulinum toxins. I shall end my presentation here, and I would like to thank you all for your participation. Enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you.